next hop up with is Mike's going to be talking. Uh, where is your bio, sir? I mean, I don't really. This, this is like Mike. Mike has done stuff. Mike has done a lot of stuff. Mike is a is former Black Hills. He's a friend. Is currently a red team R and D engineer at CrowdStrike. Oh, look who's here, Mr. <laughs> Kim. How's it going? Good, man. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. I just wanted um, to like, I guess, crash the party. I wanted to say hi to Mike. What's up? <laughs> How's it going? Since since I dropped in like in the middle of what Marshall is saying, and I, clearly I'm not needed here. You guys have a great afternoon. Mike, good to see you. I'm hanging out with you guys. Hey. Yeah. All hey. right. I'm gonna go away now. Cheers. No worries. Have a good one. <laughs> so yeah, Mike has been everywhere. He's done a lot of stuff. He began his career in 1997 as a Linux administrator. Eventually led him to numerous offensive security engineering roles with focus on hardware software security. He has led forensics instructors for Teal Tech. Chief Breaking Officer at OWASP Orlando. That's an awesome role. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> and is currently on the advisory council at Polk State College, helping to guide their information security programs. Mike is awesome. And we got two minutes of banter to go on. So what you been up to, Mike? What, how, how's life been going? It's good, man. I'm sick. So if my voice is choppy, I'm all meted up right now. So I got a bunch of Advil and everything in my system. So I should be good to go. But Good times, good times. That, that's yeah. uh, yeah, that's uh, you got you got to take the edge off the talk there. That's fine. You got, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Other than that, man, not much else is going on. Um, I have a lot of content here, so I'm gonna have to ramble through it quickly. I didn't know what to cut, and so. Oh no, absolutely. Cut. Actually, actually, if you have a lot of content, I'll let you start right now, good sir. You go at it, and let me get my mic off and my webcam off all right floor is yours good deal so what we're going to talk about is modern red team weaponization and the idea of it is more or less some of the stuff that i've been doing um, in the last few months and just kind of dumping a lot of that kind of in the presentation and so as you kind of talked about me a little bit I do red team r d mainly and i've been doing some sort of exploitation since like old school renegade bbs backdoors so like mid nineties. And then I started kind of getting involved with more of the actual like exploitation of boxes with an old vulnerability called CGI bin PHF. It was like a local file include that it came out before 97, but obviously, you know, being a script PDI, I, I got it like a year later, but I've been developing software at some capacity since I was able to get visual basic three on the where's channels back in the day and been officially pen testing on and off since 2005 with a little bit of all of this in between. And so as we kind of jump into the agenda, we're gonna step through automated tool deployments and we're gonna look at how we could take these automated tool deployments and roll them into our C2 frameworks. And then we have a bunch of payload stuff to look at um, depending on how much I get through. Hopefully it'll be a pretty good, pretty good delivery. So that's kind of the agenda. and. Um, so let's jump in. Let's just jump in. So on the automated tool deployment, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how to roll our tools or profiles kind of through a an automated continuous integration, continuous deployment process that actually wraps directly into our C2 frameworks. And so the first thing that we want to really do is look at some of the components that are involved with this. And so we need to worry about where our repo is. So are we storing it in Git? Are we storing it in a private repo? Is it GitHub Enterprise? on the corporate side. And then we want to, within that, vet our code, right? So we want to make sure that whatever we're pushing into our production environments for our operators or as an operator, that it's, um, that it's been vetted already. And so with that, we'll roll into the build, right? So a lot of different builds have different platforms or they have different dependencies. And so the build is kind of that seamless compilation that you would, you would occur, like if you were developing on your local machine and kind of building it. So we're going to automate that, that compilation. And then what I like to do is I like to wrap in my OPSEC for my payloads or my tooling kind of at that stage. And so we're going to perform some payload obfuscation, mainly for evasion. And then um, we're going to look at some artifacts because artifacts are going to be what the build process produces and what our release pipeline is actually going to push out. And that could be anything from the tooling that we're actually using to post exploitation payloads. And then um, we're going to integrate these directly, pulling them right into our C2 frame. And so that's kind of the process of what we're going to be looking at too. So for vetting our code, like let's look at this for a second because a lot of people don't do this. And I noticed like I'm a big I'm a big 
I did the same thing. Like I never always looked at the open source tools that I was using or the frameworks. And so like what's actually happening in the tool? Are we understanding what's happening within the tools, frameworks, scripts that we're actually running and that we're using? And um, and so, or is it still using the default values that's you know been sigged to death? Are we still you know spawning run DLL thirty two? And can we make these minor changes that could avoid these defaults so that we're not going to get caught like right off the bat? And then you know what forensic artifacts are going to be left behind? Are they writing to the disk? Are they storing it somewhere like in a temp location or you know modifying something on the machine that we didn't necessarily know about because we're just after whatever the tool outputs kind of giving us? Another question that I like to ask is, is it loud? Is it going to lock out accounts or, or cause outages? Like this latest uh, zero login or zero logon vulnerability, the, the latest CVE that, that kind of came out that um, Dirk's Jan's been kind of dropping some really cool stuff on. Like if you use some of the original, the initial payloads that were, being, that were being released, they were resetting the machine account. And if you reset the machine account, it was going to get out of sync and you were going to start breaking stuff. And so not knowing that, but just running that um, right off the bat, it's high risk. So we want to be aware of this kind of stuff. We want to be aware of whether it's writing, like unsuspecting writing to disks or what protocols it's using, what processes are being spawned. Is the process that's being spawned usually communicating online or is that going to be like one of the indicators that an EDR company or a blue team is going to be able to detect on? And so, and then another thing, like what, what is the parent process? I mean, is the parent process something that's completely weird and it's like an anomaly and that's going to be standing out like a sore thumb? Because if we can modify some of this stuff and vet that code and then push that into our master branch, we're going to be really good. And so um, that's kind of the vet your code component of this, and that's going to put it into the repo. And so with that in the repo and having our latest code kind of in our master branch, we can start forking open source tools, looking through it, kind of vetting it, making minor modifications. And then maybe we just do some sort of branching in our repo and then push that to the master branch. And then anything in master branch could be considered like production in our case. And and so with that, we can move into kind of the, the continuous integration portion of the automation. With this, we need to know our dependencies, our platform requirements. You know, a lot of times if we're spawning processes or we're, we're injecting into a process, we want to make sure we're using the right platform, if it's x86 or x64. Some of the memory injections, for instance, or callback hijacks are very specific. Like some of them only support x64. And so Understanding the platform that you're kind of going for and whatever the OPSEC needs are for that is going to um, to be what we want to kind of plan for up front. And we also want to know what what are we integrating? Are we integrating like just raw assemblies? Are we looking at like C2 profiles, like something that we want to kind of roll out in an automated fashion? Or are we just looking for, you know, the, our payloads or our tooling uh, frameworks? And so when we understand what those final packages are, now we could ask the question, well, do we need any signing? Are there any archiving? Are we trying to encrypt anything? And then once we have kind of that, that idea, now we have, a, now what I have to do is worry about where we're going to stage these, these at the end of the, the release pipeline. And so by understanding where it's going to be staged, we could position it in a place where these final assemblies or tools can be integrated with you know, very seamless integration. Now, be careful on this, because if you are using like any sort of customized or proprietary tooling, you want to make sure that you're going to lock down where you're staging these payloads before rolling them directly in, because you don't want to accidentally expose them externally and then release your, your offensive tool. And so the other thing we want to kind of make sure with that is understanding you know, the, con the context of where the tool is going to be. If we're just using an open source tool, it's probably less important, but if we're rolling our own tool that we haven't released, then that's obviously a, a much bigger condition that you know would regulate that. So all right, cool. So moving on, looking at the components of a pipeline, like we have a build pipeline. Now the build pipeline is going to take all the dependencies, the platforms and the opsec and kind of combine it into the compilation like we were talking about earlier. Now there's also a release pipeline and this is very similar, but it does all the signing and the archiving and then copying or encrypting or anything else that we would need in order to, uh, to handle these artifacts and, and push them to their final destination. And so with the artifacts, we're, we're, these are the artifacts that are going to be a part of the build process. So once the build happens, a successful build is going to create these artifacts. And these are going to be our assemblies. These are our profiles. These are our payloads. These are whatever it is that we, we specify as our artifact. And this is just moving components. And then the storage that we're going to use. In this case, we're going to use Azure Blobs because we're going to use Azure DevOps. But you could also do AWS S3. You could do web servers. 
you can do SSH and kind of push it to a server or whatever you really want to do. It's fairly straightforward with, with where we do it. So we, can, we have our options. And so next we're going to want to prep. Now, because we're using Azure DevOps, it's fairly straightforward. Just go create an Azure account on portal.azure.com. You're going to enable Azure DevOps uh, by going to dev.azure.com. And then you're going to create your DevOps organization and the project. Now, this is just basically your build project. You could have multiple projects. You could have one project with all of your tools. You can do it in a, many different ways. I tend to focus on creating one project, one repository with all of my tools. And then I just I build uh, one solution with a bunch of projects, and that just makes it easier. Um, but you can do it whatever way you feel um, is best. And then you're just going to connect everything. So just real quick, just a slide. I threw this slide in there for the slide deck just so you'd have it, but just to kind of recap. Super trivial to kind of create and, uh, and should be good to go. And so once you have this kind of set up, you're going to want to jump over to um, prepping the actual Azure account. So you're going to go to Azure. You're going to navigate to storage accounts, and you're going to click Add. Now, in the screenshot that's on the slide, you'll see that there's a resource group that you're going to have to create if you don't have one already. Creating one is just as, as easy as clicking the button. Most of the defaults that you're going to find in here are fine. And then you're going to choose your storage account name. You're going to pick your location. It's probably not that big of a deal on the location unless you're an international company and you want to make sure that you know your operators are only fetching from a location that's within that region. But otherwise, you can just go with whatever. And um, the rest of this stuff is pretty easy. Once again, if you are doing any sort of artifacts that are confidential or proprietary, make sure to find a way to enable access keys. Or if you're using S3, use you know some sort of uh, some other way to do it to secure it. You're just basically wanting to lock that down. And then um, because we're using Azure Blob here, it's just going to roll right into Azure DevOps super seamlessly. And so. The first thing that we're going to have to do once we have all of this set up is we're going to create our pipeline. Now, creating a new pipeline is going to give us the ability to create like with a boilerplate pipeline that Azure DevOps kind of provides. And so you're going to want to connect it to your repo. So you're going to select your repo. And there's a number of options you could choose from. You could use Azure, Azure repos. Actually, you could push code directly into Azure if you wanted to store it there. You can use Bitcoin, Bitcloud, uh, Bitbucket Cloud or GitHub or GitHub Enterprises. You can pretty much use any of them that's there. When you do that, you're gonna, it's going to require you that you authorize your GitHub so that you can select the repo, especially if it's a private, because you're obviously going to need to give it OAuth access in order to authorize the Azure pipelines in order to make whatever modifications it needs. And the other thing that's going to prompt you to do is it's going to prompt you to approve and install the Azure pipelines on that account and once you do that you'll be you'll be pretty much good to go and so you're going to want to con consider kind of where you're having it here now i've done it where also i've had um i've had one repo which i would use like azure the azure repo but we might have code internally hosted and i could push locally to multiple locations and so i could kind of update and keep the team up to date with the code but while also keeping the azure build pipeline up to date for the artifacts deployment. So moving on, we're going to need to configure that pipeline now that we have it created. So there's a number of boilerplates that options that they let you build from. And this is going to give you that kind of like a starter pipeline. And so you could choose from a many different options that they have. So if you're building something in C++, they have a nice one that comes with GCC. If you're building like a web app, MVC app, or something with like ASP.NET, they have multiple ones you could choose from. In our case, we're just choosing the .NET desktop because that's going to spin us up our Windows latest VM and give us what we need in order to kind of have a, a .NET build environment. And so there's a number of things within this pipeline that we're going to have to end up setting. One of them is a, a trigger, which is basically what's going to end up happening on the, the check-in of the master branch. We want to be able to trigger that pipeline build. And then there's tasks that are in, involved with these uh, these pipelines and these tasks are basically lots of just functionality that you could wrap into your build. And then um, I do one other step in here that's not super straightforward. It's it's versioning. I kind of version my artifacts in a, a little bit of a different way. There's probably a better way to do it, but once again, I kind of went off the cuff and when I was putting this all together. So this is what the YAML looks like. Uh, I know Marcello loves YAML. So the build pipeline is basically 
it has a trigger in the, in the top box that's going to trigger on our master branch. So anything that gets checked into our master branch is going to trigger this build pipeline. And then we have the VM specified that we're going to be using. They gave us this whenever we click the boilerplate options, which is the basically the, the latest Windows VM so we can have a good build environment. We're going to set some variables in here, which is the solution and the build platform. Once again, I have projects that I roll into one solution. But if you didn't want to do it that way, you could you could specify multiple solutions or whatever, however you want to do it. This is just like the basic. And so it's going to actually pull all of your dependencies from NuGet automatically. It's going to make sure they're all working and it's going to restore that solution and those dependencies so that it can be prepped before the actual build, which you'll see in the bottom box down there where it's building the solution. So building the solution, you're specifying it here. I'm on line 23. I specify this is my x64 build. And so what I would normally do is, and, and I don't have it on the screen, but I, I have another section, another task section for the VS build where I'm actually building x86 as well. And if you notice on the very last line, line 25, I do some stuff like allow unsafe blocks because obviously we might be doing some unsafe stuff within, within uh, the memory or like memory injection or whatever we're doing. But I also specify the output directory to be x64. And that's because I really want to separate my my build artifacts by platform. And it's going to make more sense whenever we integrate into the C2 framework. But just know this is how I do it kind of on this side. And so the second part of this YAML that you can't see here is you'll see on this slide, I run my OPSEC. So I, I tend to prefer creating a specific project within the solution called OPSEC. And I put all of my OPSEC logic that goes into there. And we'll talk about OPSEC in a little bit, but Offset code that will modify my binaries, will stomp them, will do whatever I need to do on those actual payloads before or before they get released, but after they get built. And so what I do, what I like to do is after the build is successful, because OPSEC just got built because it's one of the projects in the solution, what I'll do is I will actually run inline script because one of the cool things with the build environment is you can run scripts, you can run commands. And so I'm actually running that working directory OPSEC payload against the x64 directory. And this basically, my OPSEC is going to enumerate all of the binaries within that x64. And it's going to perform whatever obfuscation on those payloads that we want. And it's going to, so, so that the final payload will actually be updated with whatever modifications for obfuscation occur. Now, I mentioned earlier, I tend to do custom versioning, which is a little bit weird, but I like it this way because it seemed like it was the easiest way to do it. What I do is I just run a command line task within the build that I echo one dot, whatever the build ID is, because the build ID gets incremented with every build. And then I, I push that into a version dot text, which seems pretty straightforward. There's probably a better way to do it, like I said, but you know, not being like a expert at this kind of stuff, um, this seemed to work pretty good. And I'll show you where I use this later. But then I go into the next task, which is archiving it. I generate a... a uh, tar gzip file of everything that's in my my working directory and i so I just create that zip and then i publish that zip as an artifact and this is important as we step into creating a release pipeline and looking at some of the artifacts that are there but it's really cool because you can run some of the cli commands you know directly in the build environment you could do a number of different things if you wanted to but i also i didn't show it here but on the version.txt in the second red box, I also publish that as an artifact. So at the end of the day, I have a .tar.gz artifact, and then I also have a version.txt artifact, which gives me the flexibility later on whenever we're doing the integration. And so next, we need to worry about a, a release pipeline. And so not to be confused with a build pipeline, within, within Azure DevOps, there's another section just a couple below the build pipeline, which is a releases. When you do that, you can create a new release. And the different components of a release is a stage. So like if you wanted to push to like a dev environment or a production environment or to a, a C2 server and then a, a relay or something, you could set up different stages. Stages are basically just groups of tasks. So these tasks are going to perform the final actions on the, the, the artifacts that you have there. So if you're wanting to move them to like Azure Blob, which is what we're going to do, that's just one of the tasks that are in there. And you're just going to connect your artifacts from the successful build pipeline to your release pipeline. And now artifacts are not going to show up whenever you're creating 
your release pipeline if you've never ran a, a successful build yet. But when it does run and it's there, you'll see it. It'll pop up and you're good to go. The artifacts, whenever you click it, click the add button to select the artifacts, you're just going to select the source. Now, you could have it from a different place if you really wanted. If you wanted to pull artifacts from a repo, you could do that. I'm pulling it directly from the, the build pipeline. And so I just specify the project. I specify the source of that build pipeline. And then I, I just click add. The alias, I believe, is going to automatically be created. And it's going to pull the last version. This is not to be confused with the version text. This is the actual build version. But you're going to add that artifact to it, and you should be good to go. Next, all you got to do is add your tasks, and that's what we're going to do next. You do want to verify that the artifacts are being preserved and are accessible on your Azure blob. Um, you know, I've had lots of build fail and lots of release fails whenever I was putting this together. And so, and it was usually something silly. But so before you actually start setting this trigger to be live, you want to make sure that, hey, is this really great creating the artifacts that are there? And then once, before you start integrating into the C2 framework, make sure that your release pipeline, whatever it's doing, it is actually preserving them on the storage that you choose. And so as we add tasks to the release pipeline, this is how we do that. So there are lots of different tasks that you could do within the release pipeline. I tend to only focus on the Azure file copy, and that's because I'm only usually pushing this to the blob. Now, there's lots of other ways you could do this. You can, like the one at the top of the, the screenshot on the right, you could copy files over SSH if you wanted to. But the idea is just basically add that task, and this is what it would look like. Whenever you do that, you're going to cho choose your source of your artifacts. And in our case, we're pulling the artifact source of our build. And then we set the subscription. And it's going to need authorization. So once you set that subscription, you're going to need to click the little authorization button. That's usually going to pop up there. It's not visible there because I've already done it. You're going to choose as your blob, if this is where you're storing it, you're going to choose your storage account. And then you're going to set your container name. And then the YAML on the left is basically what it looks like if you click the view YAML button. It's pretty straightforward, not much there. And then, so that's your, that's your release pipeline. Now all we have to do is set up that continuous deployment trigger. And so there's a little lightning bolt on the release pipeline. If you click that, that, that lightning bolt, you're going to see the build, which is the project build that we've chosen, and it's disabled. You're going to want to enable that. So what that's going to boil down to is this pretty much this flow right here. And this is where we're, we're shooting for. So we have a developer who's you know, vetting their code. Everything looks good. They push into the master branch, which goes directly into GitHub. GitHub, because it's on the master branch and it's already tied into the Azure DevOps, that pipeline is going to kick off. It's going to kick off the build. The build's going to pull that latest code. It's going to compile it. It's going to do all of its magic, all of its OPSEC stuff. It's going to push it. It's going to say, hey, this build successfully completed. And then because that release pipeline is triggering on a successful build, the release pipeline gets triggered and the artifacts get moved to the Azure blob. Now, in our case, what we're going to talk about here in a second is aggressor scripts. So our aggressor script for Cobalt Strike is going to basically retrieve that artifact blob, pull it into the, the operator's environment. And we're going to have nice, pretty menus so that they could just click their payload, select their platform, and do whatever they're doing. So that's basically the overview of the entire automated tool deployment process. So for C2 integration, let's talk about what that looks like. So what we're going to need to do is retrieve the artifacts from that remote storage. We're going to store locally for the client. And because we have completely separated the x86 and the x64 builds, we have a distinction now for our payloads. And we're gonna we're gonna phone home to our artifact storage, and we're gonna grab the version.txt that we published, and we're gonna compare it to our local one, and we're gonna integrate it into our tooling, and we're gonna use Cobalt Strike for that. So Cobalt Strike integration is pretty awesome. I'm not gonna be hammering this too much, but aggressor scripts based on uh, Raphael Mudge's sleep scripting. So you kind of have like lots of really cool scripting plus some of the awesome. Uh, aggressor stuff that you can do within your CNA. What we're going to do is we're going to automatically check for update. And the way that we do this is, like I said, we're going to check the version information from the release artifacts. And then we're going to say, you know, if it's modifying the assembly name for the OPSEC real quick, let me side note on this. 
if we're modifying assembly names for OPSA during the build or during your build process, you're going to want to maintain mapping. Now, this is outside the scope for this, but just be aware if you're changing your um, if you're changing sharp up, for instance, to you know sharp down in your assembly name, you want to make sure that you're you're maintaining that mapping for the integration into, the, into your CNA. And I'll show you why that matters in a minute. And then what we need to do is just distribute this CNA script to the operators. And um, and you may also want to consider updating the CNA to kind of add some other sort of automation, like Gressor Assessor from 40 North does a lot of that cool stuff for automating a lot of the immediate tasks. And so the update, this is how I how I run the update. This is really cool. So, so I'm using the, the sleep scripting, but I'm using curl in order to fetch the version information on that line three, the first red box. I grab it, I store it locally as version.txt. I go through, and then if you look at a number 11, it's gonna actually open up that script resource. And this is not looking at the temp one that you just downloaded, this is looking at the one that's actually on the machine. Now, if that is there, then it'll get a handle on it and you can read the contents of that file. And then what we're gonna do is if you look at line 18, we're, we're comparing the latest version versus the current version. And then if, if the latest version is newer, then we're gonna prompt the user, hey, do you wanna, you wanna update to the latest? And if so, then we run our updater and it's automatically gonna pull down all of those artifacts. You don't really have to worry about having a build environment locally, you could just pull everything in. And the cool thing with this is if you have a red team that you're kind of managing this stuff for, if you're on a red team and you want them to use the same types of payloads or the same type, you wanna make sure that they're only using vetted code, this is a really good way to kind of do that and just mix it automated. And they don't have to worry about, you know, spinning up a build environment, making sure that they're running their OPSEC and they're not leaving like PDB paths in their filing or whatever. So now this is just this is just to check for updates. The next one is going to be running the updates. And so in order to run the updates, we're going to delete all of the local cache of the assemblies that we're downloading. And then we're going to fetch the artifacts zip file. Now, obviously, this is like a unsafe URL because there's no access keys in here and whatnot. There's no way to prevent anybody from actually accessing this. Right now, there's not anything there. I'm sure plenty of people are trying to hit it right now. But And we're going to do the same thing we did before is we're just going to curl. We're going to grab that download path. And then we're going to run tar and then un unpack it locally. And we're going to be good to go. That's going to have all of our x86 payloads that are already have OPSEC ran against them and our x64 payloads. It's going to have our version.txt because it's also embedded in the artifact locally. And, um, and that's going to give us the ability to kind of um, add in some of the actual user interface integrations that we all love so much. And so that's what this looks like. Now, I'm not going to show you the code for this. It's, it's kind of straightforward. I will be releasing the CNA script for this in case you um, want to play with it and you don't want to have to worry about writing your own update logic and, and whatnot. But it's, it's fairly straightforward. You could just add your beacon menu. So if you wanted to right-click your beacon and then you know choose it, it's going to create this little pop-up dialog, and then you could select your tool. Now, the mapping was important because this tool, or the CNA script, is actually going to enumerate your, your assemblies and then load them as tools in this combo box dropdown. And then you could select your platform. And so it's going to swap out if you're setting it to x86. It's going to swap out the tool absolute path to the x64 or x86 tool path. And then you can also type in your arguments. So if you're running some sort of like sharp up with some command line arguments or seatbelt or something else, you can just specify the arguments that you want here. And when you click run, it's just going to run execute assembly with the with uh, the tool name and the arguments, and you're going to get it back. Um, and the other cool thing I do is I add the to the attacks menu. I do a uh, a menu item there, and you do check for updates. Now, what I also have it doing is I have it checking for updates whenever it starts. So that way, if it, there is a new update, it phones home and it grabs it. And then, if not, you could just manually check it if you want. The only thing that you'll have to remember is that whenever you're using this, if you're wanting to update your payloads. When when you load, you have to load it through the script manager. And once you do that, and if there was an update, you're going to have to just reload the script within Cobalt Strike because I don't really know an easy way. Actually, I don't know if there is a way for Cobalt Strike to actually update the scripts using code somehow. I don't think there is. I couldn't find anything, but that's kind of the 
the nuts and bolts of, of that part. And so that's kind of it. So that's it on the C2 integration. So now we have kind of our build pipeline and our C2 integration. Let's talk about payloads a little bit. Everybody loves payloads. So I really wanted to include some of this stuff, and I was trying to figure out the best way to kind of include payloads within the build environment. And I really wanted to release some, like a project that kind of had it all together, but I really ran out of time. So I have some of the stuff that I'm going to push live, and you'll see at the end. And so let's just look at what we're going to talk about within payloads, assuming we have time. I mean, it looks like we're we're doing pretty good on timing right now, but we have a lot to cover here. And so, so payloads, let's talk about simple OPSEC obfuscation. So what we're going to cover here in these next few sections have already really been covered by a lot of awesome researchers. I try to, to, um, to cover who those researchers are and their prior work kind of throughout this section, these next couple sections. Some of it I haven't found anything on. Some of it I have, but it really wasn't very clear and it's been old, but some of the stuff is relatively new, and I would not even do justice to the researchers that have documented some of this stuff. So I'd rather just point you to some really good research on this area um, and just kind of have some dialogue about it now. And so so we're going to look at some of the obfuscation techniques that we could do for OPSEC. We're going to backdoor some .NET binaries. And so that's going to be pretty cool. That's going to be, um, there's a tool associated with that that I'm going to release. I've been meaning to do that with Hack the Planet, with Bo Bullock and Ralph May and Steve Boros. We just haven't got a around to it, so I figured now would be the best time to do that, and maybe we can cover it, cover it more in depth soon. We're going to look at reverse pinvoke. This is basically calling C++ stage or running a C++ stager or stub to execute our .NET assembly. Sounds kind of weird, like why would you do that? But I hopefully will cover a little bit of the reasons why we would do that. We're going to look at calling um, syscalls from C Sharp. It would be really cool if we were able to call you know, C++ stager to call our .NET assembly that's actually executing our syscalls, but that's a little bit outside the scope. But you could definitely put it all together and just make one really weird, obfuscated um, headache of a time for reverse engineers. And then we're going to look at some WNF callback hijacking. This had done, I've seen some really great research on this. I know Bo Bullock and I did some really good research on this a while back at Wow Hack and Fest that I'll cover a little bit later, but I want to kind of look at using that for code execution is basically what we're going to talk about. And so to get started, um, some of the common obfuscations that we can do, randomize strings. Like, so if you, if you have your assembly, randomize the strings, randomize your class names, your namespace names, your function names, your variable names, randomize everything. A lot of times, AV are just singing off really simple thing. We see that a lot with a lot of the tools that do obfuscation, myself included, have manually done this historically. I would build some sort of template, like I built my, my templates. I still kind of do build my templates or my, my code using templating, and then I replace those templating. I know some other people that have built frameworks for payloads that did something very similar in like Python. But Adam Chester, XPN, um, as widely known, did phenomenal research on this and provided great resources for being able to do this. He actually released some research that introduced me to using Rosalind to do this, which was amazing. We'll talk about that in a second. But also, like I said earlier, pay attention to your assembly name. You'd be surprised at how many EDR companies are able to catch you very quickly because your assembly name is something that is sigged to 100% death. The other thing, too, is PDP, uh, PDB path. So like whenever you're compiling these, that debugging path is going to get put into that assembly. And it's, it's crazy. You could, you could literally replace the PDP path, PDB path for your assembly using like well-known APT group paths and, you know, kind of prance around as an APT group. I don't, I know, I don't, I wouldn't know whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, but you could do that. Um, if you don't want to simulate or emulate an APT, you know, if you're like, if you're targeting, like if you're on a red team for like a bank and you wanted to, you know, prance around as an APT group, that's like a financial APT group, just go Google like their PDB baths and then use your, use that in your assembly. You'll just, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, otherwise just clear it out. Don't do it, but make sure you clean it up. Cause the last thing you want to do is have like, M Felch in your PDB bath, and then you know everybody knows that hey, you just like leaked that in your in your malware. The other thing too that I would recommend doing this is like this is relatively new to me. 
Um, I know that the technique's been around for a while, but brute force your shellcode. So a lot of times we always just Zor our shellcode. So, but that Zor key, a lot of a lot of EDR, like they're really good at this. They'll just extract the Zor key from the shellcode by looking at the header bytes because there's a lot of null bytes that are in there. And so they could just extract it fairly quickly and then get access to your payload. So I'd recommend I'd recommend using like a simple brute force. There's been some projects that are out there that do this automatically. I've started moving in this direction. So that's what I would recommend. So looking at the obfuscation, the first one that we were talking about on the randomizing. So there's some NuGet packages called Microsoft.code analysis. And that kind of gives you the ability to use like a MS build workspace. And it's amazing. You could call open solution async on your solution. And it, it gives you like code access to code. And you could enumerate your projects and your documents. And then you can get the syntax tree and and literally just load your classes, your enums, your namespaces, and set the name and then just try apply changes in order to save the solution. In the screenshot here, this was a uh, seatbelt that got the assembly name re, uh, renamed to likely totally not seatbelt. And then if you look at the, the namespace and the classes and function stuff in here, you'll see this was um, from Adam Chester's blog post that I posted on the, on the previous slide. And he let me use this because I didn't want to have time to kind of recreate this in a way that made sense. So it was just easy just to kind of include that in there, but it's super awesome. And you, bear in mind, if you're doing this with Azure DevOps, you can kind of build all of this directly in there without having to worry about adding new templates. It gives the ability to add new stuff later without having to worry about creating a bunch of different templates and, and what. And so that's kind of on the renaming. So looking at backdooring.net. So I'm releasing a tool called TrustMole. And what TrustMold does is it gives you the ability to identify, like, let's say that you identified a legit .NET assembly on a network share. Now, how, many, how often do we find that? It's all the time, right? I mean, normally we find, like, we might find an ASP.NET DLL assembly. We might find code that got, or not code, but a compiled binary that got pushed to the network share because every employee needed to run that executable. And so they just create a shortcut on their user's desktop to run that binary. And oh yeah, by the way, we accidentally have write access to that, that .NET.exe. One of the ways you can find these really quickly is looking for app.config or web.config on those network shares because nine times out of 10, it's going to accompany like an executable or a DLL file that's um, being hosted for this very reason. And so all you have to do is create a malicious C, uh, C Sharp payload. And then what Trustful does is it injects that payload directly into your target assembly methods using MSIL. And what it does is it's going to overwrite the original target assembly with your new injected assembly. And then it's going to time stomp it so that the, the new injected assembly matches the original one. That way it doesn't look like it was modified. And then all you have to do is wait for that backdoor assembly to get executed and hopefully rain shells. And so Trust Mold has a few different injection techniques currently. There's one that does load file. And so it's basically just taking that load file and load base 64. It has also, or it'll do load base 64, or you could just load a byte array directly. And so it, because it has built in time stopping, it makes it super, super trivial. So it's basically taking that load file function and injecting that IL for it into your target assembly is how it works. And so you could, uh, you could also specify the class and method name that you want to inject for execution. So one thing by default is TrustMole will in, it'll inject the IL into all of the functions within your target assembly. That way it makes sure it gets, it gets called and gets executed. So if you are using it that way, you want to make sure that the payload that you're running has some sort of mutex to know that, hey, we've already ran. We don't need to run again. Um, and then just exits out. Uh, so, and so with that, I'll jump into a demo here of TrustMole. What I did here is I created a payload demo with some code. It's just, it's pretty straightforward. It's run, and then it just prints out that payload running. And then I created another one called target demo. Target demo is just going to run the target demo code. And then we have a number of CLI options that we could choose from. This is the actual trust mode or trust mole code. And so when this runs, it's basically just going to build our payload 
and this is the output. And so we have payload.dll, which is that's the project that it's going to create. And we have target.exe. So if we ran target, for instance, we're just going to see target demo executing. And that's, that's pretty much straightforward. So what we want to do here is we just call, we call trust mole. So if I run trust mold, it's saying you need an injection, payload, target, and output. Not a biggie. Make this a little bit bigger here. So I'm going to call trust mole. I'm going to call. I want to. I want to do the load byte array, and this is basically going to convert the payload into a byte array, and then inject the byte array and the execution logic into the target assembly. And so we're going to say we're going to target our target. Now the target.exe in this case would just be whatever file you found on the share that you have write access to. You could also use a network share if you wanted to, and you could write directly to the the network share. And then we're going to pass in our payload. Our payload is payload.dll in this case. We're going to specify the new output file, which is going to be called injected.exe. We're going to say we're going to run that function. And we're going to say minus s. And so, and there's a number of other stuff in here too. So minus s is just going to stop it for the original time. When we run it, Hopefully it's working. Commander, there you go. All right, so it loaded the target, it injected it, it injected it into all the methods, and then it's it's running the class instance called run because we specified that. You see the creation time beforehand, and then the creation time afterhand. After basically just got stomped, and then we have our new binary there. And then when we run injected, it's it's our combined payload. So our payload still runs, and the original code that was there runs and that's pretty much it and the cool thing with this is let me show you i'm gonna actually i'll show you on the next screen i'll go back to my slides because um i have it on my next one so this is the the end result so the top left was our payload assembly this is using reflection and then the bottom left is our target assembly Hey, using Mike? reflection yes hey, sorry you got the uh um, uh, you're right. Present Sorry. mode. Yeah, no worries. Swip back over. All right. So we have our payload assembly, which is basically going to be our um, our payload that we embedded. Our target assembly is down there on the bottom. And then we have our new injected assembly, which is the byte array with our IL that's injected and it's good to go. And so that's basically what the new final payload will look like. And you'll notice that program and main both got injected. You can specify one or the other or both, but I did all. So. The next one we're going to look at real quick, and we're going to have to breeze through these because we're getting short on time. Uh, reverse p invoke. So this is basically calling C sharp from C plus plus, and the idea behind this is so that we could thwart high level reversing. You know, a lot of low, a lot of, a lot of incident responders or malware researchers that are going to be jumping into like .NET are just going to open it up in .NET um, some sort of reflection tool like just decompile and just look at our code directly by stubbing it out in a a C plus plus stub gives us the ability to just to instantiate the CLR instance from within our C++ stub and then call it directly, start the runtime. We could load our internal or external C Sharp DLL, and then we could just execute it. There's two different ways to execute it that I have here. One's execute in default app domain, one's invoke three. But it's not going to stop reversing, it's just going to slow them down, right? So it's an easy win so you don't fail over immediately and uh, removes that low-hanging fruit from some of the automated analysis tools. And so with an external payload, you're just going to, this is the C++, so you're just going to create the CLR create instance. You're going to get the runtime, like on line seven. You're going to get an interface on that, and you're going to start it. Um, once you have it started, you could just call execute in default app domain and then pass in your DLL path. This is if you're calling it from an external, like on disk somewhere or on a network share. And then you could just instantiate that, that class and that, call that function and pass your parameters, and it's going to run your C sharp code from C++ to kind of get around that other stuff. Um, if you wanted to move into like an internal payload, you can do the same thing. It's this is kind of like pseudocode. I didn't have enough room to kind of do everything, but it's pretty much the same exact thing. So you have your meta host, you have your runtime, you create an instance, you get the default domain, you query for the interface. But in this case, you're actually going to populate a a byte array. So you're going to you know use your byte array and you're going to populate it with whatever safe functions that you're going to want to use within C plus plus. 
And then once it's loaded, you just call load three on the payload entry and then call get entry point and then invoke it. And then when you do that, you can do it externally. So if you wanted to pull your byte array from an external source or if you wanted to load your byte array directly into your C++ stub, so you're just not having to worry about having a, a file on disk, that works as well. And so we'll leave that loading the byte array up to the listener, but um, have fun and it should be, should be pretty cool. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about syscalls. So syscalls, I'm not gonna, ha- I'm gonna have to breeze through this. I'm not gonna be able to cover a lot of this because I'm gonna run out of time and this is, gets really deep. So just understand that there's a Windows 32 API that extracts low level calls from, for user mode apps in order to interact. So like if you wanted to write a file to disk, right? That's, a, that's writing to hardware, that's a kernel operation, but syscalls give a user mode app the ability to trigger that context switch to, to the kernel so that the kernel can take over execution and copy that user mode stack into the kernel and then once it does that, it's able to, uh, to do what it does. And so there's a couple of components behind that. So most applications are going to call these higher 132 APIs. And that's just basically the subsystem in Windows that gives us the ability to kind of communicate with the operating system. And then the kernel mode is going to switch over and then start talking with our device driver directly. The reason why this is like even a thing um, and that we're talking about, and there's been a lot of really great research recently with this, is, is because of some stuff with AV that we'll talk about in a minute. So the moving components with this, in order to do this from C Sharp, we have the common language runtime, which is basically the runtime environment for C Sharp payloads or for any .NET payloads. It's basically a built-in language compiler and it manages all the execution for that payload. So MSIL is Microsoft's version of the intermediate language. It's, it's basically platform independent instructions that get compiled using the language compiler and then just-in-time compilation or JIT compilation, which is going to take that MSIL and turn it into native code so that it can get ran. C-sharp assemblies load into the CLR, which is going to convert the MSIL to the native instructions before it runs it. So that's kind of where the CLR kind of comes in. So there's lots of different language compilers, C-sharp compiler, VB.net compiler, or if you're a Marcello, Boolang compiler. And then the process is pretty straightforward. Um, this is the very opposite of unmanaged code like C++, uh, C++, which is always left up to the developer. So any garbage collection or making sure you clean up everything afterwards is left up to. So it's, it's basically pulling all that, abstracting it, putting it in the CLR so the developers don't have to worry. And so basic evasion. So a lot of AV are using user mode cook user mode call hooks in order to monitor what's going on. And so you can imagine like an NT write file an NTDLL being hooked by an AV. And then whenever you see something that's kind of where it sees it as suspicious, perform some action. So there's been a lot of great research already on unhooking. So I'm not going to cover that here, but there's a number of layers of abstraction that before the syscall gets executed. So what we're wanting to do really is just call that syscall directly, which gives us the ability to bypass any of those hooks and then run straight syscalls. So it's not perfect science. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. You're going to have to set up your unmanaged code and so basically, Win32 API create file function call that you would normally call from an API is going to be followed up by another NT create file call. The NT DLL is going to be the module that's going to use to be used. But basically, what we need to do is we need to convert our unmanaged function pointer to our NT create file delegate, which is basically our callback function, so that when our syscall gets triggered. It's executed. The problem is C sharp doesn't have in um, doesn't have inside inline assembly. So what we do is we just set up our assembly co- code in a byte array, and in that byte array is our ASM instruction for our syscall, and then all of our delegate structures and everything get called. So whenever we call our function, there's some stuff that gets invoked, and it's it's a lower level syscall that gets executed, and and it's it's probably too much to talk about now because I'm running out of time. I know I'm going to get close out here, but I want to do a, a quick shout out to syscall project called Sharp Call by Jack Hallen. Does great extensive research on this, um, kind of outlining some of the other research that's already been out there, but it's it's great. So there's a number of projects that are already using this, like Dumpert, I'm actually jumping back real quick. Um, I have it on this slide. So uh, Dumpert, Cornelius Dupla, uh, or C. Nealis at Outflank covers it with LSAS memory dumping, dumping using uh, direct system calls. And it also does some API unhooking. Sharp Sploit's using it now, which is kind of uh, pretty cool. Fuzzy Sec implemented some syscall stubbing because you have to stub out and match out your delegates to match the original syscall. So that stuff changes from version of Windows to version of Windows. 
So he does a good job of uh, implementing that. And so with that, um, I'll touch on this real quick. This is um, the last part, um, which is WNF callback execution hijacking. Extensive research already at Black Hat 2018 by Alex Ionscu and Gabrielle Viella. CrowdStrike, uh, Bo Bullock and I did some stuff at Wildwest Hack and Fest 2018. Excellent research from FuzzySec uh, with Wind Farm Dynamite. Odzan did some cool stuff initially with being able to get code execution using this. And basically at a high level, it's publish and subscribe Windows subsystem that allows processes to track events and their subscriptions and a callback table. And then they can subscribe to these events so that whenever something gets triggered, they get a notification from the kernel and that kernel will call that callback function that's specified. And so what we do is we, uh, we have code execution without having to worry about injecting, using any of the memory injection techniques that have been so prevalent and then have been getting SIGged a lot lately. So all you do, you enumerate your user land processes, you pick an offset safe process, you allocate your shellcode in your, in your stub process that you've done so you can get your pointer on it. And then you leak the WNF subscription table and then you look for a specific subscription called WNF shell logon complete. You could use any of them. You just have to be able to trigger it. I'm looking for WNF shell logon complete, which is a system scope event that's signaled every time the user's desktop is ready. And then you overwrite that callback with our allocated shellcode shell code pointer. And because it's a user, a user land process, we can overwrite that callback pointer in that memory. And then we trigger it. Whenever we trigger it, we call that that um, that kernel call uh, NT update WNF state data, and then the kernel is going to look for it. It's going to enumerate all the processes that have that subscription, and it's going to execute the callback. That callback is actually our malicious shellcode or a malicious payload, and we have code execution. And so, since we are so close to time, here's the payload. This is my shellcode. This is Notepad shellcode. It's all abstracted in that code execution. I'm going to save you the headache of having to worry about the WNF code, I'm just going to show you what happens when you run it. It's Notepad. Just kidding. So that's the result, Notepad. Code execution in this case, silly, I know. But look at the code. Uh, WinFarm Dynamite does a great job of it. I'm going to release some a slimmed down version of it in that repo that I had on there. Just follow my Twitter. Prior research shout-outs I wanted to cover real quick on my last slide. Syscall. Cornelius to Plow, Cornelius at Outflank did a lot of great job at that. Ryan Cobb, Cobber from SpectreOps did some cool stuff with syscalls. Jack Halen at NCC Group. The WNF research, uh, there's lots of it out there. Most of that stuff can be looked up looking at these projects. Research is amazing. We wouldn't have been able to do it without this stuff. And that's pretty much it. So thanks for joining. Watch my Twitter for trust mold release. I'll also open up that WWHF 2020 GitHub repo. My Twitter handle is at you stay ready and and feel free to reach out. I don't know if we're gonna have any time because I think I'm right on the dot. But uh feel free to to reach out on Twitter or on Discord or on Slack if you're on Central Sec or on on our Hack the Planet Discord. Come join us on Hack the Planet. Ask us how to join that. Uh, we do some webcasts every once in a while. And that's it. That's all I got. Thanks, sir. That's awesome. That was awesome. And I was on mute. Yeah, that was amazing. And yeah, I was actually going to ask you, like, if, if that the trust mole is already released, but you're going to you're going to release that soon, I guess, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I have to. Uh, so I have some other stuff in there that I have to kind of pull out before I can release it, just because it's it would be bad to release something that would cause damage. So I want to make sure that some of the stuff that gets released is uh, is safe to release. So there's some added functionality in there that I got to make sure I pull out. But yeah, I'll get that pushed out and uh, and I'll tweet it and make it available. Being responsible is responsible. <laughs> yes, I have to be responsible. And I should probably add everything because I didn't cover it in the beginning. Everything in this presentation is my own, right? It's not like any of my employer or anything. So yeah, just uh, put that disclosure in there in case any of them are watching and I'm safe from the uh, the lawyers. Awesome.